Hey, what's up? This is Sully from Godsmack. Strap on those boots, baby, because you are now in the trenches of the war room with the one and only Mistress Carrie right here on the Mistress Carrie podcast. What's up? This is Joe Rogan, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. I have so lovely pretty eyes. Hey, this is Brent from Shinedown, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hey, Carrie, go put your brow on, girl. Hey, this is Steven Tyler, and you'll be listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. What's up? This is Aaron from Stan. And you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Grohl from the Food Fighters, and you're listening to the one, the only, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is David from the Band Disturbed, and you're listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. Hi, Bruce Dickinson here from Iron Maiden. Yes, indeed. Miss Whiplash herself, Mrs. Carrie, is here to um, unchain your brain. Hi, this is Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. This is Dennis Leary. You are listening to my favorite, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is Corey from Stone Sour, and you're listening to. You have the privilege of listening to Mr. Scary. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Hey, it's Mistress Carrie reporting for duty from MCHQ for episode 183 of the Mistress Carrie podcast. And before we get to this week's guest, author Philip J. Chris, I want to remind you about the stocking stuffer sale that's happening in the shop online at mistresscarrie.com. You can grab everything from Mistress Carrie guitar picks and coffee mugs to coasters, and you can even put my balls on your tree. They come in purple and black. Plus pint glasses, shot glasses, mouse pads, sticker packs, and a huge selection of t-shirts, jerseys, tank tops, hoodies, and beanies. Just head to mistresscarrie.com and click shop. Back on episode 32 of the Mistress Carrie podcast, I interviewed sound engineer Frank Scambalone. One of his co-workers, Philip J. Chris, just retired from being a roadie because now he is a full-time author. His new book, The Crime Thriller, The Roadie Cartel, came out on Friday, December 1st. When I started the Mistress Carrie podcast, I wanted it to be a rock lifestyle podcast. So I could not only talk to the rock stars, but the people behind the music. And when Frank made the introduction to Philip and he told me about his new book, I had to have him on the show. Philip was born in El Paso and influenced by his Spanish, Mexican, and Czechoslovakian heritage. And after spending years on the road as a professional tech, he took all those influences and wrote his new crime thriller, The Roadie Cartel a book he started during COVID when he couldn't tour. Philip came on the show to talk about the inspiration for his new novel, all of the artists that he toured with, and why Spinal Tap is still brilliant because it's still true. What's the journey like to go from roadie to writer? Find out on this week's episode. So allow me to introduce you to roadie turned writer, Philip J. Chris. Hello, Phil. Thank you for doing the show. Hello. Thank you for having me on the show. Hey, wait, is it okay to call you Phil or is Philip preferred? I mean, you are a published author and all. <laughs> I go by Philip now. Do I you really? used to be a Phil. Yeah. And then uh, when I was trying to figure out the best uh, name, my uh, wife manager said, why don't you just use your full name? It's kind of rock starish. And I was like, all right, done. So Philip J. Chris. Ooh, Philip J. Chris. Just the, le- just the initial. There is no, uh, there is no, a Y after the J either. You sound very official that way. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very unofficial though. I'm very new to this game. So I'm just trying to have as much fun as possible in it. I'm one of those people that, that gives people nicknames, even when they don't want them. Like I'm always oh. shortening people's names and calling them. And then they're like, well, well, I'm on your show. You you feel free. You can nickname me today if you if you like. Nah, nah, nah. Philip, it is. Philip, <laughs> it is. Congratulations on your new book. It came out on Friday. The Roadie Cartel. How are you feeling? Yeah. I I'm feeling really well, actually. It's I thought I was gonna be nervous and terrified and all the things, and and it's kind of surreal. It's just it's out there. I I did it. I'm done. I can't change anything. And all the words are in the world now. And so I'm just soaking it up and enjoying the the ride now, I guess you could call it. The Frankenstein monster is out of the lab. There's nothing you can do to bring it back now. Absolutely. There, I, there is, it is done. <laughs> For anybody that has never heard of you before, doesn't know who you are, you and I are new friends because of a mutual friend 
who was a mm-hmm. previous guest on the show on episode 32 of the podcast back on January 13th of 2021. Our mutual friend, sound engineer, Frank Scambalone was on the show. Yep. Yep. And, and he told me I had to meet you. Oh, I love Frank. And by the <laughs> way, the bar is set high because I've had a lot of rock stars on the show and Frank's episode is one of the most popular episodes I've ever released. And he was shocked by that because he's a he's a roadie. He's a tech, a sound engineer. He works for the rock stars, yet his episode mm. is more popular than a lot of the rock stars episodes. He has the dirt. He Actually, he's a comedian. I don't even think he's an engineer anymore. I think he's just a comedian. That guy's amazing. <laughs> well, Italians from New England, that's why Frank and I get along so well. We're a certain Definitely. breed of people with a certain sense of humor. <laughs> And you're either horrified by us or you want to be our best friend. Best friends. Best <laughs> friends. I'm in. I want in. I want in this this uh, Italian nor'eastern that you guys are brewing. <laughs> so Frank was like, hey, I want to connect you with a friend of mine because he's writing this book. Mm-hmm. And I thought the idea of the book was really interesting. It's called The Roadie Cartel. And it's something where you've kind of combined these two... Um, Normally symbiotic businesses, <laughs> yeah. because with drugs always comes rock and roll, thus, you know, add the sex in there later. But mm-hmm. um, but I thought it's really interesting because you're a tech too. So when it comes to the yeah. roadie part of it, you know that really well. Yeah. And, and I think that that's what, um, r- what made writing this story so fun was that the inner workings of the backstage are just so they're just so long. There's so many different avenues and there's so many different ways that gear travels. But at the end of the day, it still just gets put in a truck and goes down the road to the next city. And though that sounds simple, it's a very intriguing business if you've never been back there or been a part of it. So are you a full-time author now or are you still working as a tech? I'm done. I I hung up my tech uh, coat (laughs) My my engineer code, everything, all the the hats that you wear when you're a roadie, I hung it up and I went full full on as an author la- earlier this year. Like I think the last gig I did was for Kiss. Wow. I filled in. Yeah, I filled in for a buddy that they needed an engineer, and so he asked me if I could go out and mix front of house for Kiss. And I said, uh, Yeah, I can do one last big one and go out with a bang. <laughs> and they just went out with a bang over the weekend. Their final live show. Yeah, so it was re- it was really cool that I was a part of their last thing and then I just after that I got a couple more calls to do like little things and I just said, "No, nope, I think I need to focus on being a writer and an author." And it's been I still have a very very long way to go, but so far right now it's been uh, pretty wicked. Are you have you always been a, a reader? No, I think I think to be honest, writing and reading for me went out the window somewhere when I was like 14 after my first concert or maybe my <laughs> first or second concert. I knew at a young age that I wanted to be something just in the limelight. Well, I, I, there for a while, I was like a dirt bike rider and a, I wanted to race cars for a hot minute. But the road always had that um, that appeal to me. So as a at a young age, I, I kind of knew that I didn't want to go down the, the school road. And... I didn't pick up a book probably for 20 years, to be honest, as sad as that is. I'm not a big reader or wasn't. Once Mm. I got out of college and all the stuff I had to read, I was kind of burned out on it. But during the pandemic, I tried to start picking up books again because the Mm -hmm. noise coming out of the TV and the Internet was just too much. Too much. And so I, I tried to find that like Zen quiet to start like reading again and it's taken a lot to kind of exercise those reading muscles some people can just rip through books and i'm not one of those Mm -hmm. people no i and i had to just to go back for a hot second the last book i read was anthony Bourdain's kitchen confidentials then like i said it was almost 20 years it might have let's just say 15 to 20 years i hadn't picked up a book and in the pandemic i picked that one up again before i even started writing and it was it was really cool because I was able to go into it, but it did take me a minute to like pick up that pace again. But his storytelling really, I think, fired up 
a little bit inside of me because he's just he was so vivid with his he was another Frank of the kitchen world. Right. His stories were so real and so vivid. And he painted those those pictures for you perfectly on paper. And so it is hard, though, if if you're not interested in the subject, it's, it's quite reading can be very tedious. Yeah. I've had the the honor of meeting a lot of like famous musicians and celebrities over the years. Getting to meet Anthony Bourdain, I kind of mm. nerded out about it because I was such a huge fan. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I have his signed book sitting next. It like sits next to me on my shelves because it is inspiration. A guy that was in a kitchen that just started to write a book one day about his adventures, and I mean, it's though mine is fiction. His almost seems fiction at sometimes, yeah. you know, it's so wild and so out there, but it is it, it, reading is um, and I, I started to use this kind of funny way of saying it. Like, I want to make reading cool or rad again. I want to bring back reading to where it's not just left for a certain demographic or a certain group of people. It, it, it should be fun to pick up a book and people should find some sort of joy just as you leave like a rock show, there should be something that leaves you going, wow, or that was incredible. Like, I want more. Well, let's go back to the beginning so that we can figure out how you ended up becoming the published author that you are now. <laughs> so where let's did you grow it. up? Well, the other side to the roadie cartel, right? So um, I grew up in El Paso, Texas. It was right on the border of uh, Cedar Juarez <laughs> and, um, El Paso, Texas. And I just, I lived right there up until I was about 20 years old. Are you bilingual? Can you speak Spanish too? Not well at all. I can probably <laughs> understand more now, but as a kid, you, like you grew up in it. So I spoke it pretty fluently as a kid. And then as time went on, you get lazy and I stopped speaking Spanish to my, my family. And then, yeah. So now I can just I can get through a good menu if I needed to. I was going to say, when you're on the road as a tech and you're traveling everywhere, being somebody that grew up on the Mexican border, your tolerance for bad Mexican food has just got to be like non-existent. I, I, I know exactly what I want. And I'm you put something in there that's not the way that I grew up. I'm like, oh, this isn't Mexican. But I think like they're like growing up in that southern border. Everybody from California to like Brownsville, you know, has a very, very distinct flavor of Mexican food. So, yeah, first thing I do when I go to that part of the country is find a taco truck. First thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's hard to like get to London and someone's like, we should go get tacos. Nope. Indian (laughs) food. Yes, but not tacos. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But funny enough, there is a restaurant that one time I was walking down the streets and I saw it was called El Paso. (laughs) <laughs> Look at that. I just never get away from this hometown. <laughs> well, it'd be like Frank and I taking you for good Italian food in the Northeast. Like, yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. Don't tell us there's like good Italian food in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Like we know yeah. good Italian food. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Steaks, steaks to stay over there. Italian. Yeah. Well, let's go. <laughs> so you talked about it a little bit when you were growing up and you went to that first concert that kind of changed everything. What was that concert? Yeah. So like um, it was uh, really rad at about nine, maybe even eight. Well, my my I grew up listening to Howard Stern in the car with my mom. She would take me to school. My dad was like a Genesis ZZ Top. Um, you know, I'm sure he had a like another one in there that I'm forgetting, but he was kind of that 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 sound. My mom was like very Led Zeppelin, Cat Steven, just very eclectic over on this side. And when she would take me to school, she would listen to Howard Stern. And your mom is badass. Yeah, she was pretty rad. You know, over the years, like um, we we have definitely butted heads. But yeah, like I I credit her for my adventure in, down this path for sure. Like she took me to go see my very first concert. Well, back it up. I started loving music. Green Day, I really got into and Guns N' Roses. And I was supposed to go see... Guns N' Roses, Metallica, and Faith No More. Saw that tour. Oh, so many people did. And it was at Las Cruces. And there's people I've toured with that, that were like, oh, yeah, I was on that tour. I'm like, damn, so cool. She didn't let me go. Oh, I don't know why. mom. I know. Yeah, that was like the one thing I always, I was always, I held that against her forever. <laughs> but 
she totally redeemed herself because then the next five were just off the hook. She took me to my very first one and it was you two in public enemy. Wow. At the Sun Bowl. Yeah, it was really cool because that was my first true experience of watching a giant production. And I was I was mem- like hypnotized or you know, it just it took a hold of me, the lights and the, I don't know if you remember that tour. I had the cars up in the stadium, they yeah. flash and those cars, weren't they hanging in the lobby of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? I think you're right. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. So that was the very first one. And I believe if it wasn't that one, it was the next one, Pink Floyd and the Pulse Tour. And I came home and my stepmom at the time had asked me, like, how was it? Like, did you have fun? So I can't remember if it was either or, but um, I said, oh, my gosh, it was it was amazing. I want to do what they do. And. To her, that meant I'll oh, be like a rock star, be playing a, mu- uh, a musical instrument. And my answer to her was no. I, there was like a guy standing on the side of the stage doing like I don't know. He had like long hair. He was just standing there. Like I want to stand on the stage and watch a show. <laughs> no idea what he was doing, but to me that was like the coolest thing possible. And so the next few shows, I think I just spent just staring at the stage and staring at all the parts that came with it and it was rolling stones uh voodoo lounge tour and then it was robert plan jimmy page i don't know if you remember that uh um, oh, i do I yeah what was the name of that uh it's like their acoustic like thing that yeah. they were doing and then uh after that it was uh <laughs> alan jackson <laughs> <laughs> I was in Texas, you know? I understand your mom not wanting you to go to that Guns N' Roses Metallica tour because they played in Foxborough, Mass, at the old Foxborough Stadium five days after the riot in Montreal when James Hetfield still had his arm in a cast and his tech was playing guitar for him. And there were a couple moments during the Guns N' Roses set that Axel pulled an Axel. Mm -hmm. And everybody at the show started looking around like, oh, no, is it about to hit the fan again? Like... It was a really weird vibe on that tour. And so I can I can kind of understand. I had my sister with me who was still in high school and I was like, We need we're gonna need to be able to get out of here fast. Yeah. No, definitely. I it, um fast forward the first sh- uh tour I ever did for the company that me and Frank worked for was Guns N' Roses. And it was through Canada in January. And it was one of those like uh, moments where it kind of rubbed it in my mom's face, but it really didn't. <laughs> I just kind of was like, she was like, oh, that's cool. You're going out on tour. I was like, with Guns and Roses. <laughs> remember that? Remember that tour I wanted to go on, mom? Mm-hmm. Remember that well, show I'm I at, wanted to see? Now I'm actually on tour with them. Right. So it was, uh, it was, and, but there was a couple of moments where he, yeah, he, d- he did come in quite late and we all kind of started looking around like, hmm, maybe this is going to happen all over again. Yeah. It never did, but. It's funny that you said like that you were like, I want to be the guy up there. Like, I don't know what he's doing. I used to want to become a sound engineer in a recording studio because I grew up watching MTV and saw the people behind the giant console and was like, oh, I could hang out with all the bands. And then (laughs) I interned at a recording studio for a summer while I was in college and we recorded a 27 piece mariachi band all summer. And I was like, this is not Motley <laughs> Crue. This is not what I signed up for. And then I just kind of stumbled into radio. But it's funny that you mm-hmm. could see something and have it look so glamorous and amazing. So glamorous. And it's so not different. glamorous. No. Yeah, so different. I, I, in my mind, the the staring at it and then i'd go home and watch mtv but it was all when bands started to do the live they'd put like their song to a live footage that's what got me like molly cruz home was it home sweet home or something like that a lot or, of dead or alive sure. all the backstage sure. oh footage. yeah he flies in jo- jovi's coming across the audience i mean it is by far all the, all of that got me as a kid and I had no idea. I grew growing up in El Paso. There was though there was great music that came through. It was only those big shows. So there wasn't like a giant. There was a small punk scene. There was a small rock scene, but there it wasn't you know Boston or it wasn't uh, Providence and stuff like that. So it was hard to try to figure it out. But seeing those buses roll in, oh man! All I wanted to do was just get on one and. 
And I finally did, but it was it was a journey. <laughs> did you grow up just a fan of music like I did, or did you grow up a musician that was also a fan of music? I, I, that's a hard one because to this day, I don't know if I love the idea of a rock star more than I than I like the actual music. Like I, I think the lifestyle is just so intriguing, and I've always just really music in general i think is just so intriguing because it moves people so deeply and you can be attached to a single artist so intently and 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 to me i just i've never i don't think i've ever had that but i love listening to music but so i, I it's hard to answer that in a in a very honest way i think there's a mixture of both like i played violin as a kid and the bass but i didn't love it so I, so there wasn't that aspect, but then I would listen to Green Day's Dookie before I went to bed or November or, you know, use your illusion and it would put me to sleep. So there was something there that I loved about it, but I just never, I think I just loved the idea of music or the whole idea of how it moves people. So how did you find out that you had an ear to be able to mix music if you're not really that prolific of a musician? I... Honestly, it was all just through great and people just teaching me like, this is what this should sound like. This is what this should sound like. This is what this does. And, and even then, like I only mixed a handful of shows over my entire career or was a front of house guy for, for any, any specific person. I was more the, the guy that made sure the front of house guys, speakers and all that were all set up properly. But again, it was meeting guys like Frank that, that, they just showed me a path that I had never seen before. And then it was easy to just, all I had to do was kind of copy and paste what they were doing. <laughs> ah, you're, you seem smart. I'll just copy and paste this over here. So what was your first roadie gig? Uh, my first actual roadie gig. I, well, it's kind of funny. Like I said, like I walked away, I was actually like uh, in the food service and I went to a school called Full Sail down in Florida and in when I went to Full Sail, I met a guy named Kelly, and he owned an audio company there. And, and he said, "I need some help uh, doing a show on the Fourth of July. You want to show up?" And I didn't. I had no idea. I was like, "Yeah, sure. I can move stuff. I don't. I have no idea how to do this." And he said, "All right, be here at this time." And and so my first actual gig was helping him just move boxes on this really busy street down in Orlando, Florida, in two thousand five, and. I think about a month later, he gave me a chance to mix some really terrible cover band on that same street. <laughs> <laughs> but he showed me how, you know, like I was already kind of going to the school to learn how to mix. So I kind of knew, you know, you know, the buttons and stuff. You're like, I think I'm doing this right. But he kind of helped me like, all right, hey, you should blend it a little this way and blend it a little that way. And I was like, all right. So over time, I think it was just more, um, you know, being in those moments of mixing really bad cover bands and really bad local bands and just doing that over and over again. And then all of a sudden they kind of sound better. You're like, Oh, Whoa, last time you weren't this good, but you haven't gotten better at playing guitar. <laughs> it must be me. Right. <laughs> Orlando's known for all the theme parks and stuff, but there's a big music scene in that part of Florida. Giant music scene there. I mean, it was really cool because he, uh, Kelly had a very big foothold in that, I think music scene growing up because he came from that area. So, you know, like he was attached to like the Creed guys in a certain way and uh, Matchbox 20 and Seven Mary Three. And, you know, so, and I love Seven Mary Three from El Paso because I felt like that was one song that was in rotation all the time. And I just, I don't know, I dug them. And, but yeah, being, and then you have all the pop, the boy bands and, it, it is a very musical friendly little city, to be honest. So I got a lot of work. So when you you go from kind of working with cover bands in Orlando, um, you're going home at the end of the night, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you got to go to the point where you get offered a tour and finally get to get on the tour bus and have the mm -hmm. actual I'm a professional roadie experience. So what was the first tour? It was the Guns N' Roses tour up in Canada was the very, I, 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 I told Kelly, I was like, I think I need to leave. I think I need to go do something bigger. I'm just, I'm getting stagnant. I'm like itching to be on one of these freaking tour buses. And he's like, one day you'll just, you'll hate it. And I was like, no, there's no way possible. I can hate this thing. You look at those things. They're million dollar tour buses. 
And uh, my buddy at the time was working for the same company that Frank and I did. And and he said, yeah, they, come on, throw your application. And so I did. And yeah, I, I had to go through their like little programs and stuff. But the first gig I got, I got this phone call and they're like, all right, you're flying to Winnipeg on like January 4th. I was oh. like, Canada? <laughs> oh, it was... I had never been to Canada before. You know where but, I grew up, right? Yeah, like I'm, I'm a, I'm a desert rat. Come on now. Oh, it was cold, but I had some really cool people that, again, just guided me and took me under their wing and just were like, "I'm going to show you. This is what touring's like, man. This is the real nitty gritty, you know." And and it was really rad to be on that tour because some of those guys had been with them since, you know they started or had been on that tour multiple times or been on the big one that all hell broke loose on. So hearing those stories and, and, and coming up with them, it was, it was really rad to have that be my very first tour guns and roses, even though it was really just Axel and like dizzy and feel like that was really it that we're from back in the day. (laughs) The stories about the backstage legend of Guns N' Roses in that era of the band. Are the stories and rumors true? (laughs) Not when I was out there. (laughs) Uh, I mean, it was, I will say this. I think that was the most disappointing thing as someone who is just in love with the idea of music and rock stars and just like, how cool can you get? Uh, When I feel like, the the really the most rock star band I toured with was Nickelback. They Chad is a rock star. And I was always like, where are all these rock stars? And it took a few years to get to their their tour, but holy cow. Yeah, Guns N' Roses, it was I was there was nothing happening backstage. It was pretty quiet other than the band having some wine up and waiting for Axel to go on stage. <laughs> The guys in Nickelback have taken a lot of flack over the years. And I always say Dimebag Daryl was a fan. Are you going to say that Dimebag was wrong? You can't. You can't. You can't. And I will say this, Chad, I mean, funny guy. He is a rock star, though. He just has that attitude. And so I will I will say my entire career, they were, were the biggest rock stars I personally toured with. And the backstage lived up to a lot of that fun. Really? Yeah, it was just why like the 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 fun atmosphere back there, the parties, it was like, you know, band and crew and no boyfriends allowed. <laughs> <laughs> I always love going to see them when they got really really big. Yeah. Because there would always be like the soccer moms who would like the love ballads. And then they would go to see Nickelback and then there would be all this fire and guitar solos. And these women yeah. would be in the crowd like, what's happening to Nickelback? Because they had no idea they were a rock band. Uh huh. Pyro going off behind them, the concussion shots. I mean, it was it was a full on rock show. We would stand around and watch those soccer moms walk in with their husbands and their husband definitely went to go find their hardest, you know, slayer shirt that they bought at hot topic you know two weeks ago and (laughs) they'd be standing there with their beer and they wouldn't smile the entire show and then photograph would come on and you'd watch these guys turn into little teddy bears they'd be (laughs) hugging their girlfriends singing in their ear oh it was great they're just putting the moves on for later that's all they were doing no it was i mean but and you you've been to the show i mean what other band is firing off t-shirt cannons and throwing full beers into the crowd i mean it is a it's a spectacle so going from guns and roses and being freezing cold every day and you know kind of miserable like i was like this is this is touring like this is not what i ever envisioned it to be to something like that then i was like oh wait this is kind of because it was nickelback bush seether and my darkest days and so it was a lineup where That's it was a fun show. It was a very fun show. And at first I was like, Bush, like, okay, like they're they don't seem like they're gonna fit in between Seether and but the minute Gavin ripped his shirt off and people and started running through the audience, oh yeah, it was on. Gavin was, was just on the show a few weeks ago, and if you can see up above my head, that's uh, Gavin yeah. and I. And that picture became a meme because you can't see it up close. 
But Gavin is looking with me. They they captured the photograph at the moment that he looks like he's madly in love with me. And so Aww. it was like, love something as much as Gavin loves Carrie in this picture. <laughs> like, that's why it's yes. hanging on the wall above my head in my studio. That is brilliant. I freaking love it. <laughs> yeah. No, that is. he. But again, he's uh, another he is another rock star that singing yeah. it when he sing, sang in the rain, like it, whatever uh, it was on MTV, some beach house rock star moment. Yeah, absolutely. Chad Kruger from Nickelback way back in the day when the first record came out, they played a Halloween party for us. And it was like at the old radio station I was on it in Boston. And it was like three doors down Nickelback. Oh, wow. I think Creed might have been on. And they were all when these bands were all brand new. Mm -hmm. And I was interviewing Chad backstage and I was wearing heels because I was dressed as like a librarian as my costume and my shoes were killing me. So during the interview, he took my shoes off and started rubbing my feet. And so I have a picture of Chad Kruger from Nickelback before he was the rock star he is now rubbing my feet. And anytime I get a chance to remind him of that, I do. As you should, yeah. as you should. That exactly. is a very good thing to remind. Hey, hey, don't forget. Yeah. <laughs> um, when it comes to touring with rock bands, it is impossible to not have a spinal tap moment. Every mm. band member has had a spinal tap moment. And it's one thing for the artist, right? Because they're on stage knowing exactly how the show is supposed to run and what's supposed to happen and when and where they're supposed to stand. But a spinal tap moment for the crew is completely different because you guys are all back there going, oh, shit. Oh, yeah, definitely. So what is your biggest spinal tap moment that you remember dealing with while you were out on the road? I will say one of the like and it's happened multiple times and I'm sure most crew guys have gone through this is having a new bus driver and you're circling the venue. You clearly are like that. Is, we need to go in the, and they're just doing circles around the venue and you're you're just watching your time i need to get off i need to go get my truck i need to go do this i need to go do this i need to eat breakfast i'd love a coffee right now i have to poop you know like (laughs) and there's no pooping allowed on the bus (laughs) yeah yeah because you can't go on the bus maybe the rock stars can they have they have different nicer buses than us crew us slums (laughs) i have heard that more often than not that bus drivers Getting people lost in the parking lot of a venue happens more often than anyone would ever believe. Oh, I and and in some of these, you know, big cities where you can only take a left turn or like a Boston, you know, if you pass it, you're you're not just passing it and spinning one simple street around, you know, maybe in like Omaha, Nebraska, it might be easy there, you know, but. You know, you go to like New York City and your bus is trying to get you to Madison Square Gardens, you're and he misses the right turn. And you're starting to watch your time run down with the locals there. You're like, all right, I just have to hop off and run to the door. But yeah, I would say that would be. And at times it's kind of funny, too. You're just like stuck. Like there's nothing you can do. You just got to laugh it off. And But that would be my biggest Spinal Tap moment. Just stuck on buses doing circles. And I guarantee you somebody on the bus in that moment said, hello, Cleveland, because Spinal Tap <laughs> is funny because it's true. It is so true. And and there is, I mean, there's so many moments that happen like that. You know, you watch like a someone break something and you're just like, this is the wrong time for you to break that. But it's not like they meant to break it, but you're just like, like, what are we going to do? Well, you got to run. And then you watch like the new guy, like he's going to save the day somehow. So he takes off running, but he's running in the wrong direction now because the stage manager moved all the boxes. So now the bot, you're like, oh, well, the boxes are over here, dummy. So then you, then you're the 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 smart one you're like all right well i'm gonna go over there but there's always something i think backstage that any road guy or any crew guy can honestly say oh yeah this is this was fun (laughs) anything that can't be fixed with a leatherman or a roll of gaff tape it's like yeah and now nowadays it's so funny too because most flashlights are off cell phones so you know you're like every roadie pulls out a cell phone they're trying to get their flashlight on and (laughs) There's a new Spinal Tap movie coming out next year. Did you hear that? I absolutely just saw that today, actually. And Paul McCartney, Elton John, Garth Brooks, they're going to have cameo appearances in it. This It's going to be insane. Amazing. And I feel like Garth Brooks is one of those underrated, like, superstars, too. He's, he's a rock pretty, star. Yeah, he's, like, very rock star. And to see his show is 
very rock star. I've been to I've been able to work a couple of his and every time I'm just stunned at how that man in those tight jeans with a guitar strapped to him can sprint across the stage still at his age. Well, they make the jeans stretchy now, so there's a little more (laughs) give to those jeans. I don't think he's just wearing (laughs) Wranglers off the rack from Walmart. I think those got a little give. Uh, All right, I'll I'll give you that much because there probably is, yes, a little little built-in love nowadays, but gosh, like the man can sprint. And those country artists are ripping off a lot of what rock stars have been doing live for years. Those big country shows now are just big rock shows from the 80s now. Absolutely. Spinning drum risers, drum risers that lift up. I mean, I got a chance to tour with the Scorpions and they still did the, the, the drum riser would go up. They'd hop on each other's legs. Smoke would come billowing out. Actually, that's where I met Frank. Guitar riff, head banging. Oh, it was it was beautiful. But yeah, and then you go watch, you know, uh, a country act nowadays and you're like, oh, I've seen this before. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know where this came from. <laughs> so who else did you work with through your roadie career? Name drop a little bit for me. Oh, man, I I, I, I was I was able to work with some cool ones. Carrie Underwood, uh, Paul Simon was a really rad one. I got a lot of tattoos on his tour. We were. <laughs> We spent a lot of time in New York, so I found this one tattoo shop that I, I, went, I visited quite frequently. Um, Did you get to spend end, any time with him at all? You know, it, it, surprisingly with Paul, I got to spend a lot of time hanging out with him just on deck, like on like the stage, just not necessarily chatting about everything. But there were a few moments in time that will always be very dear to me where like I got my throat tattooed. And I came in and, you know, he's a short guy. So he's, you know, his head looking at your throat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I stand up and he looks up at me and it was a dad moment. And he just was like, why would you do that? And it (laughs) it, like it hurt me to my core because I was like, well, but I and I didn't have an answer for him. And I just kind of walked away like it's like you got me, Paul. But there was another moment where, you know, he lives up, I think, in I don't know, Connecticut or somewhere up there. Right. As, and he uh, asked him how his day was and he paused. And it was like a long pause, too. And we're in catering. And I was like, well, maybe he wants me to go around him. Maybe he doesn't want me to talk to him today. Like, he's always been very friendly. And I was, just as I was about to go around him, he like pulls his phone out and he starts flipping through pictures. And he's just like, Phil, I had a bad day today house is covered in snow and he like shows me this photo of his house we were in like rehearsals you know and his house is just annihilated with snow he's like i had to shovel the driveway <laughs> and i was like all right <laughs> you know or maybe like he maybe it was like shovel my sidewalk or something i was just like oh yeah that could be a bad day yeah well have a nice lunch oh we just kind of parted ways again it, it, and it was more interactions like that my entire time but what a what a cool dude like just Hands down, another one of my favorite bands I ever worked with. It's so funny when you talked about like associating music with with memories. Paul mm-hmm. Simon is two of the most vivid memories of my life. No way. That we we hitchhiked out of Woodstock ninety four, me and a bunch of my friends in the back of a stranger's pickup truck. Right. After all the rain and all of that stuff, Paul Simon didn't even play Woodstock, but the song that reminds me the most of Woodstock, we get to our van in this big field, like 30 miles away from the stages, and we finally have access to the dry clothes and the cold beer and the bag of weed we left behind for <laughs> ourselves, and we're airing out the van that had been sitting there for four days while we were at the show. And we uh-huh. crank the radio and Cecilia comes on. Oh, my gosh. And it's like one of my favorite songs ever. I've always loved that song. But now when I hear that song, I am back covered in mud recovering mud. from Woodstock 94. Oh, that's so cool. And then in 2011, I was embedded as a journalist in Afghanistan with members of the 182nd no Infantry. And we were on a a convoy in Kabul Whoa! and I'm sitting in the back seat of this giant up armored vehicle and you know getting access to the aux cable was the big thing in the truck because the music went through everybody's headsets yeah yeah, yeah. and so they they just you know like grabbed somebody's iPod it's like an iPod shuffle kind of thing and everybody just put their iPods in grabbed it plugged it into the aux hit play and 
we're driving through the middle of Kabul and all of a sudden, Call Me Al comes on. <laughs> my two favorite songs. <laughs> and the gunner, my buddy Fooch, has got the 50 cal up off the roof and he's doing like the <laughs> horn thing that him and Jeff, dun, 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 dun. Yes. And yes. that image to me is so clear in my mind that when that song comes up, it's all I can think of. And Absolutely. so, you know, to to have you who's talked to him about, you know, shoveling his driveway. Yeah, and yeah, to yeah. me, his music is part of some of the most memorable moments of my life. Mm -hmm. And that's what the power of music is. It really is. I mean, and and you naming those two songs will always be some of my biggest memories of Paul outside of the fact that they're giant songs as well. So it's really cool that we share something very similar because yeah, it, music just touches people and, and, and it, it hits you differently, but it's that memory. And I think it really is cool that you have, and to watch your friend play the trumpet on a 50 cal. <laughs> I mean, you can't beat that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, no, it's pretty <laughs> hilarious. And it's it's one of those things that even when the song comes on the radio or something, I'll video it and text it to those guys, even though oh, it was, definitely. you know, 12 years ago. But it just is such Absolutely. a vivid memory in my head. That's rad. That is cool. Yeah, I, I, I can agree that... Uh, that that's a good memory. I, I, I got to work for uh, green day too. And so not only have I gotten to work with two artists that I absolutely loved, they all, they, they actually did leave me with great memories, even though like most people say like a guns and roses tour, isn't the one you want it to me. It was so cool every night to stand side stage and listen to a crowd in like Italy seeing November rain or Spain or somewhere where their native language isn't English, you know, and same with Green Day, you know, we were in Russia and standing on the side of the stage, listening to them sing, you know, any of their songs, They because they scream them, they don't just sing them back, they shout them back at the band. So yeah, it's, it's, um, I don't think any of my memories really revolve around necessarily, um, it like a super crazy impact, but I will say some of the biggest impacts I can remember is watching fans like really live a moment of just sheer, absolute, unadulterated fun at a concert. Like I can remember vividly, uh, you can use your illusion. Remember that song by yeah. Guns N' Roses? I'm not use your illusion. Um, the one from the Terminator. I'm forgetting the name of that one. I watched this fan go bonkers just apeshit wild dancing to that song and it'll i can picture every time that that song plays boom there it is in my mind so i always say that rock stars and and the text too are some mm. of the most well-traveled people in the world yeah so when it comes to places that you've gone working where were some of your favorite places to travel around the world oh my gosh i mean it's it's so when it comes to food or when it just comes to sheer, I mean, like Barcelona, Spain is one of those places where I think it's overrun with tourists, but going late night down some of those dirty little alleyways and trying to get, you know, getting hustled by the locals and putting yourself in just a small little bar and just getting annihilated drunk. I mean, who, who doesn't want to do that at, at least at one point in their life, just to say I did it. And so I think some of my most like, wild memories like that don't necessarily like um like russia will always have a very special place in my heart. might never go back but i'll always remember being walked down this street it was me and some of the green day guys and we were looking to get where we we're trying to find a bar and we ended up meeting this like probably 15 year old and he's like there is no bar and we're like oh whoa you speak english well, where can we buy beer and he was like, well, follow me. And we follow this kid for, I don't know, a mile, maybe a mile and a half <laughs> down this dark Russian, you know, road in Moscow. What could possibly go wrong? No, Yeah. I mean, it's like, what, two in the morning, you know, all the lights are like very dim because they're saving, you know, they don't want you to see anything there. And, and so, yeah, we, we're, he's feeding or we're feeding him cigarettes, like American cigarettes. He's telling us like, just, yeah, just keep following me. And we're kind of starting to get a little nervous. And we end up 
behind this like apartment complex. And one of the guys is like, uh, there is no exit on this side. Nah, we'll be fine. He's bringing us beer. He said there's beer over here. So a couple of the guys went back to the street and they're like, well, just scream if you need anything. <laughs> and so I said, all right. So we stood there. We stood there. And sure enough, this kid came out holding two plastic trash bags full of Budweiser. And we paid him some cash. We walked back to the hotel and we all sat out in front and just drank Bud Heavy for the next couple hours until we, you know, eventually all slowly made it to our room. So I don't I mean, stumbled to our rooms or <laughs> yeah, what, whatever it is. That, I'm just shocked you guys weren't all just drinking vodka out of the bottle that you well, found early- Bud Heavies in Moscow. Yeah, well, earlier we were, you know, all the, if it, if if there would have been vodka at that time, I'm sure we would have done vodka. Yeah. But I don't know, like Japan was amazing for me. Like I'd never been until recently. And so I got to experience Japan and the food there is amazing. And the hospitality was great. They did make me cover up a lot of my tattoos when I would go to the gym and stuff. Did which they was, really? Yeah, uh, not in Tokyo, but we went uh, to like one of the. Osaka or one of the more traditional cities. They associate it with gang behavior, right? Something like that. So they were like, all right, hey, if you're going to go into our spa and work out, you're going to have to cover up your tattoos. So I had like a turtleneck on and like long (laughs) sleeves and these like leg stockings, (laughs) sweating my brains out. Post Malone can't leave the hotel. (laughs) I'm, You know what? They probably let him get away with it. It is Post Malone. But yeah, being a tech, I, that was the other thing too, is like, you know, everybody is like, oh my gosh, you, you like you must travel like these rock stars and live like these rock stars. And being a tech is a totally different experience because you, you're, you're kind of slumming it in a five-star hotel, you know, which is sounds ridiculous, but you know, you got early bus calls and early this and early that, and you got to travel before them and you got long hours at work. And, but everybody loves to hear the stories. So it was a fun lifestyle. I mean, it was like no, no holds a, no, nothing will ever beat it other than what I'm doing now. So so when you're out on the road, obviously there's the, the actual work. Mm-hmm. Then there's the staggering down alleys in Moscow looking for <laughs> beer with a 15-year-old with Green Day. <laughs> but there's also a lot of downtime. Yeah, yeah. A lot of being on the bus for hours and hours and hours, mm-hmm. you know, trying to get to the next city. Is it that downtime that inspired you to become a writer? I think what insp- I think the first little go I took at it was in 2016. I found myself, yeah, in my hotel room. Just it was one of those tours where all I wanted to do is just sit in my hotel room, go get a beer, and not do much, you know. And I want. I thought screen. I always thought writing was cool. My grandma was a writer, and so I always had a feeling I that there was something in me that wanted to tell stories, but I just didn't know how, and I didn't know what medium to ever tell the story on. And I think one of my buddies actually reminded me back in high school, I had told him one day I'm going to write a book, I'm gonna write a book about sex. And he, you know, like I'm a freaking 13 year old. There's two things on my mind, sex and sex. Yeah. <laughs> but that didn't, obviously that was, that fizzled out very quickly. And I went into a completely different uh, thought process. There's a lot yeah, of money I, in sex books, by the way, because I'm one of those people that reads those trashy novels. There, There is. And, and I think if my 15-year-old self would have started, I probably would have ended up in that career. <laughs> <laughs> you might be right. You might be reading a whole different novel. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that it didn't because getting to this novel was so interesting because, yeah, like the first go, I thought, well... I have a story and I always knew it was about going to be about roadies because there's there's something there. Right. There really is. Oh, too. Yeah. And and so many people have, I think, taken stabs at it. Like there was the Warp Tour show for a hot minute. But that kind of showed it showed the work. But it really I don't know. It was interesting to a certain extent, but I don't think it really gave the audience that the nitty gritty. Right. That people want to see. And then there was the roadie show on HBO. And I think that that was a little too soft for everybody. They were like, "Yeah, no, this isn't really believable because I think roadies are a little, you know, and I don't think any roadie. Gritty, and I'm a former roadie, so I know. Yeah, exactly. And and so that was a big part to this was, okay, so then in 2016, I sat down and I started to even talk about it. And a couple of people were like, that'd be really cool if you did like a, and my idea was like a, an American Pie style roadie movie 
and I was going to, it was going to be a comedy about a guy like having, trying to get to the roadie Friday, the day off. But I just couldn't, the storyline never came together. And I, I kind of just, it fizzled out because I'd work. I would should I have to go do a gig. I had a gig, you know, and that one paid way more than me trying to be a writer at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was the only other stab. And I will say that it kind of deterred me after that because, yeah, I just got so busy with the gig. But then I started looking at all the other ways that people want to get rich. Like, oh, I'll go do this or I'll get into this and I'll take my money and go do real estate or this. And so it wasn't until the pandemic when... I finally had all that time to sit there. And and like I said, I picked up a book again for the first time and actually read and was studious and it was weird. And and uh, so to answer your question, yeah, it was the, that small stab, sure, probably put something in my brain, but it 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 went to the very back of my brain for a long time. A lot of people over the years, a lot of my friends have told me because of all of the crazy things that have happened in my life that I should write a book. And one of the things I always say is I have no idea how to start. Mm. So how did you start? All right. Uh, Do you want the long or the short? Can I give you? All right. So I I, I started doing, well, like, what was the other thing that you picked up on in, or most people picked up this habit was walking or going outside, right? During the pandemic. So I started walking in this like nature preserve by my house and it was full of trees and little ravines and all these little things that, you know, like nature again. And so some days I would go out there and I'd listen to music, which was kind of rare because I wasn't a big, I'm just not that type of guy that just listens to music unless I'm working out. So then someone had told me a long time ago, you should do podcasts. And I was like, listen to pod. I was like, what? Listen to some person talk. (laughs) I was like, what? And uh, they're like, yeah, I think you'd really like that Joe Rogan guy. I was like, the comedian, the dude from Fear Factor. And they're like, dude, his stuff's fire. So so I started these walks and one day I was like, all right, I'm going to download, you know, a couple Joe Rogans. And I did. And I found them kind of interesting. I was like, all right, this is cool. And so let's say I started doing that early March. I would do my walk every day. I would try to go take a walk. And in April, a big tree fell down in my front yard. And at the time, I we didn't have a lot of money coming in and I didn't want to go buy a chainsaw. So I was like, oh man, this is going to freaking suck. So I, I got my shoes on. I told my my wife, I was like, I'm going to go for a walk before I come back and hand saw that thing apart. Become one like, of those gonna... guys on TikTok, shirtless <laughs> with the axe, cutting giant <laughs> stumps of wood. Unfortunately, I think mine was a 12 inch uh, wood saw. So it took me a really long time. I didn't even have an axe. But I knew that I would, and she goes, well, why don't you just borrow one? Our neighbors have to have something. I was like, no, because one day I'm going to have a kid. And I'm going to tell him I cut a tree down by hand and he's going to do the same. <laughs> Guys are so stubborn. <laughs> so stubborn. And the, one of our friends drove by too. And they're like, we've drove by like four times now. Are you sure your husband doesn't want a chainsaw? And he's he out there with him. a steak knife. What the hell is he doing? Oh, well, absolutely. And, <laughs> but it was fun. But so bef- even before I started cutting it down though, I, I, I went for this walk and I had downloaded Jack Carr's and Joe Rogan's podcast and he's a former Navy SEAL. And at the time I, I, I like might've read the bio or something and it said like author Navy SEAL. And I was like, Oh, that's kind of cool. Like I was reading again. Right. I had, I had no idea what I wanted to do in life. I kept trying to think like, well, if I'm not going to be a roadie and if the whole world's going to shut down, I'm never going to travel again. What the, what am I going to do? Cause wait, hold on for a second. So, so for people that worked in an industry that were mm -hmm. inconvenienced by COVID or for people that worked in an essential industry that got busier during COVID, those of us that worked in the music business, Mm -hmm. there was an uncertainty as to whether or not our industry would ever come back. Yeah. And there is a lot of fear with anyone that worked in any aspect of the entertainment business about whether or not we were ever going back to work doing what we did before. And it was really scary. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, for a hot moment in time, used to tell my wife, I'm probably just going to end up 
being a seven year old, eight year old dude that dies in a bunk because I liked what I did. I didn't, let's just put it to you. I didn't love it, but I paid me really well and I, I knew how to do it well. And so when it all got swept out from under me, it was, it was a hard moment in time, but the walking and trying to be positive and trying to look at, all right, well, like, what could I do? And, um, I, I get out there on this walk and like right away, he just starts talking about how he used to be a seal. And then now he writes books. And I was like, man, I've always wanted to write something now that like, and it started to come back to me. It all just started to hit me. And I was like, what would I write? Like, again, same thing. Oh, you should write a book about your life. You, you have a great, you've been at all these places. You should tell your story. And I started thinking about it and, and, to me, as much as I love my stories and as much as I love to share my stories, I I was like, I don't know if someone's like, I don't know if someone's going to buy my book and listen to my stories. I'm not a Nikki Six, but what if I write a really cool fictional story? And so I went home after that walk and I, I said it tomorrow. I was like, I think I want to write a book. And she was like, we'll do it. You have nothing else. I mean, and, and it wasn't a pause. It wasn't a, there was a no hesitation out of her and i was like okay i'm gonna go outside and i'm gonna cut that tree down and i'm gonna think about what i want to do and i did and about halfway through the tree i can't remember if it was the same day or maybe the next day i came up with the title the roadie cartel and so to your point about writing something i think that was the first biggest thing was i i had a title and i knew that there was two things that i had to talk about in that book and so that was the that was the start to me writing this book. So you sit down and by the way kudos to your wife because she sounds right. like a total badass encouraging you to do something that is completely impractical in the middle of one of the most stressful times in modern mm-hmm. history while yeah. she's watching you outside cut a tree down with an inferior so uh with an inferior saw by the way. With a with a butter knife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, yeah, okay, you're going to write a book, Mr. Butterknife over there. <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> so you come up with the title first, The Roadie Cartel. You obviously yeah. know the roadie part. And I know mm-hmm. that you grew up in close proximity to like Juarez, Mexico and stuff. Mm. But I always imagined that you would have to know, intimately <laughs> know about the subject matter. How does yeah, yeah. one become knowledgeable about the inner workings of a cartel without being a member of one or were you <laughs> i will i absolutely was never a member of a cartel but i growing up in that part of the world you have friends you have family it is not unlikely that you have been a part of something that was dangerous cartelish or you know like or mob or mafia you know it's like living in new york and being an italian there's uncle freddie always seemed to have really good stories or uncle juan always seemed to tell me really crazy stuff how about come his late uncle nights. johnny has a ferrari yeah yeah how did how did that happen and so growing up there like my my grandma she worked um in the government and she did intel stuff and so listening to her stories then it you're just inundated with it, especially living right on the border. There's just always something happening. And and then you have great, I mean, nowadays, information is everywhere, right? And so, but w- one thing I did do, I did not, I kind of cut myself off from all TV. I said, all right, I'm not going to watch anything that has to do with cartels or anything like that, because I don't want to interject someone else's story into my story since I was brand new. I'm just going to take everything that I've ever seen, though. And now I'm going to start applying what I think would be the coolest drug front ever. And being in the music industry, let's be real, not far off from being in a cartel. Those two, if you're making a Venn diagram, the rock and roll and drugs, like they overlap pretty significantly. Just the the whole idea of transporting stuff and the way that you have this industry that works without having one boss sometimes, or maybe there is multiple boss, or maybe there is one boss, you know, but somehow the music industry flows way too smoothly. And I've always just had this really in like 
deep down imagination is what if like what if like what if that person really is or that building really is doing something illegal you know like and i think that's what the the fun part to writing this was was i got to do a bunch of what ifs and then i got to now now i get to hand it to people that all they do is go what what happens back there and now i'm just leaving them kind of with this well what if that really is happening back there and so though i didn't grow up with with the cartel i knew enough and i've heard enough and i just applied simple business business tactics to a giant industry that probably uses very similar tactics <laughs> when you're plotting out the idea for this book and you're and mm -hmm. you're creating a universe and characters out of thin air mm -hmm. are you writing down or dictating a draft are you making an outline of who's connected to what characters like how do you get the ideas out of your head to become a tangible thing you can reference later yeah um well i knew that like any great story there had to be the bad guy that was like obvious right but then inside there i was like okay well then who's my good guy and I was like, all right, well, I'll I'll make him this guy. And then there has to be everybody that plays kind of the role of going in between good and bad, right? And and what was really fun was I knew that I wanted to start with a big entrance, one that really left the readers going, well, I want more, but I wanted to cut it off. And then I wanted to attach that to the end of my story. So in so the, right off the bat, I had the, the opening and the closing scene in my hands. Then that was the tricky part was how do I translate this to the world? Because storytelling is also part like, well, I couldn't just have this one character tell the story and this one character tell the story. I had to have, find like a central person to tell the story. So then I broke it up into a long story where it was multi decades where this family was actually the the main characters and it was easy then to take those characters and mold them each into going their own individual way and that's told through another family member that knows the story deeper so it was uh it was hard to try to keep all the characters at first but then once i started to become the character it was easy just to like fall into place and then let the story tell itself in, in all reality so for somebody that's listening to this that Mm -hmm. is thinking about picking up the book and starting, you know, it's it's like dating, you know, is is it's a commitment to yeah. attach yourself to start a book knowing that you're going to finish it. Absolutely. So give me Absolutely. the outline of the book for somebody okay. that's never heard of the Rody Cartel before. Absolutely. I was I was hoping you would ask. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because it, because like, it, it really does like it, like me saying those last few words, I was like, man, I might as well just like spit it out. And, and so it is a tale of an immigrant immigrant family who leaves Czechoslovakia and they come to America in the late sixties, right? When music is really starting to become what it is. I mean, Woodstock and all the things, right. And I basically create this family into what is good and evil. Each character has good and evil. And what they do is they find themselves coming to America, the land where they believe they're going to find their riches and they're going to change their lives forever. And it's told through the eyes of a daughter who her dad ends up dying in this cartel. And so she's avenging her father's death through this tale of them. So it's like interweaved in there through them changing the entire music industry forever through drug trafficking. The idea of the good and evil Mm -hmm. I think that's what makes the best characters. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at a guy like Tony Soprano. Yeah. Where you know he's an absolute terrible person, but you root for him anyway because every once in a while you get this glimmer of humanity. Yeah. You know, and or that's... you see this really good person, but no one's perfect. And so there has to be a flaw in there to mm -hmm. make them believable. And, and that's what I think was real. I was actually just discussing that with my dad becoming these characters is really i think taught me a lot about myself like i think we all are capable of having multiple things go on in our life depending on what we're going through too right but 
what was really cool is I was able to yeah create a very, very bad character. But then even inside of him, there's moments of like, did he just care about something? And what that care could be, well, that's, you know, that doesn't matter. It is that, but that's the human aspect in there. And so it was, it was really fun to tell this story because although it's called the Rody Cartel, there is so many, I think, truthful aspects about humanity inside of it that really any person could read it and have an emotion behind it like they would music you know like oh i've been that person or i've done this or i've been down this road with someone and that to me i think was in the moment of covid or going through a, a very giant shift in my life i wanted to be angry i wanted to be resentful i wanted to be all these things i wanted to you know whatever like i wanted to get mine back but writing allowed me kind of to be free and it allowed me to have my own musical moment inside of a world that treated me amazingly they gave me i mean the stories i have the memories i have the all that stuff and so i wanted to also pay um homage to this industry as well i didn't want to just trash on it and so lots of edits and lots of massaging and lots of thinking about how this also affects other people that read it, you know, like I didn't give too much away because I wanted it to be still some things left, left to the imagination as yeah. it should be. The backstage area is a very important place in, I think a lot of people's worlds. And I think it's really interesting too, that you take something roadies and cartels. And most of the time, those stories are male centric. Yeah. So yeah. for it to go through the lens of the avenging being done by the daughter. Yeah. It yeah. is something that people wouldn't expect, but that I 100% appreciate. So thank you. Well, I, th but that, but there is this beauty in, in the, the music industry is that it's, it's the females like you that help run this industry have been or been here and done it. And, and, and it's growing too. And I think that it was a fun when it came to me and it, when I switched the character, it was such a, it was so cool because my publisher, who's female, my wife, you know, female, and she's in the music industry. My whole team is basically females. My pub, my uh, public publicity team, the people who helped me do some of my social media stuff, like they're all females. And it was like, what a cool way to pay respect to all the females in the industry. And then it takes some of the pressure off me too, because everybody instantly is like, oh, you're writing an autobiography or, oh, you're writing a book about your life. And it's like, no, this is not anything like it. It is completely 100% fictional. But obviously there's things that have been parts to my life, right? So. Well, also, I think anybody that's ever gotten into a fight with their sister or their wife or their mom knows don't fuck with a woman when you piss her <laughs> off absolute fucking lutely yeah exactly <laughs> and that was the character i wanted to build and that's you know like and then so though if you're not a reader the audiobook comes out and that's actually the the when frank introduced us he said oh i have the perfect voice for you and then that's how the introduction I'm went i'm so right? bummed that i didn't get to do this because it's a bucket list thing for me i've always wanted to read an audiobook for somebody so if you write another book I got you. And you need a female voice. I'm just telling you right now, I want to do it. Okay. I mean, and, and, but that's the beauty now is like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm loving this writing stuff, but that there is an audiobook coming and the female voice is this, uh, this girl, Melissa, that I, um, that the, the studio found out of Jersey. Right. And there's that grit. And it was one of those moments where it's like, if I would have talked to you probably a month earlier, we would have, it would have been that same <sighs> feeling. <laughs> But it is, but it, it has been cool to change it to a female because it it is giving, I think, the book a broader audience too. And some of the people that have already had the book and read it early are are seeing that it is a story. It's not just a bunch of dick and fart jokes in the back of a bus, right? <laughs> like as much as it started that way in right. in many aspects, because it, it, that's what I knew for years, and so it was easy for me to write that side. But then I really had to dive in and and. I had this female that um, she's a TV film agent and she was nice enough to read it to me or read, you know, she probably got like three chapters and was like, look, you could probably sell this all day long for nine 99. 
But if you want to sell it for, you know, $29.99, you really have to figure out how to tell this story. And that was moments like that where you get those, you get those moments where someone's looking out for you. Here, come under my wing. Let me show you what this is really about. And let me help you grow, which I think is important. So the book has been a very growing moment in my life, I guess you could say. <laughs> and now the idea, like we were talking about at the beginning, that it's out there. You can't yeah. take it back. It, can't. You know, it, it's, it's got to be like a band releasing a record or like giving birth. Like you created this thing <laughs> and now you have no control over it anymore. It is. And I think but being on your, this is the cool part now. This is the coolest part now is I get to share this moment with you. I get to, you get to share with people that I don't even know. Right. And, and now it has legs of its own. It it, it will do what it's meant to do. And, and all I had to do was deliver the best product possible. And, and it took a long time and we, we sat on it and sat on it or not, sat, I shouldn't say sat on it. We worked on it and worked on it because we probably could have released it. I don't know, like I said, a year ago, but we wanted it to be, we wanted it to be done right. And we want people to really look at this and, and read the story and, and, and say, I didn't waste my time. I, I'm glad I gave the 10 hours or 12 hours it takes to read a book. Cause it's not, you're, it's dating someone for yeah, a minute. It's a, it's a commitment. And it's a, and read, and if you read like you and me, well. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a quick reader. <laughs> and it's one of those things where you put it down and then you can't pick it back up for a month because you've been busy. And then you're like, where yeah. was I? I'm going to go back and read the last chapter again to make sure I'm caught up and I know where I'm going. Mm -hmm, yep. And, and it's really cool. We did a, um, we've been doing really fun stuff and we've, we're getting these packages. We did like a Kickstarter, which was new to me too. Like just been doing all this stuff that's like completely new to I haven't had a job in three years, really. So raising money and trying to build a name is it's ex it's not cheap, put it to you that way. And so yeah. we uh, we're getting these books in and and we're packaging them in a fun way. And so we have we have something very special coming for you. Really? Yes. <laughs> um. Anytime anybody writes a book, obviously in this day and age, uh, because Hollywood, there's no new ideas. They just keep making sequels and prequels. And you write something new and fresh, it has to have crossed your mind that this could be translated into some kind of visual art form. I think when most people start to read it, they the first thing they'll say is, or if, even if you read the synopsis, most people have said to me, this sounds like a Netflix show. Yeah. And I didn't write it in hopes of that, but at the end, when I closed the final you know, chapter down and we did some of our last edits, it really started to um, become real to me that there is a chance there's a shot and, and we're not pushing anything. We're just trying to let it have its natural flow in life because if that happens, I think it would be a really rad show to watch because it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be like a Narcos where you're just watching like a biography on something right. or, you know, you're, you would actually get to a chance to see something. And I think it's going to leave most people leaving concerts wondering what if and i think if it if you could translate it into the right medium and tell that story with the violence and the love and the the good and the evil and and really get capture people you have you know something like a yellowstone or something that's you know very very uh tugs on the heart in mo more ways than just shoot them up bad guys and cocaine <laughs> well if any of the characters have purple hair you let me know and i am there well, that's the beauty of writing is you never, you don't always have to give too much away. So I could have any character with purple hair. <laughs> Just call me up. I'll be wherever you need me to be. I, I love it. And and this is to me, I, like hearing you say that though, that's the, that's the, the kicker. That is the point is that the more that people use that imagination on, on stuff like this it's like then the world is like yeah you're right this should be and then it goes to this person it goes to this person the next thing you know it's in the hands of whoever needs to have it <laughs> that's right well the reason why i wanted to have you on now is obviously the book just came out but mm -hmm. for people that are looking for um a gift for that person that they think might have everything, but somebody that loves music, somebody that loves to read, somebody yeah. that's just looking for something interesting to put on their stocking stuffer list. 
the roadie cartel could be something really cool to gift to someone for the holidays. I think it's the coolest gift, not only because you could it it's my book and it's my baby and I want it to go everywhere, but you could have a lot of fun. You could get some black saran wrap, wrap it up like a brick of cocaine, <laughs> send it off to people. <laughs> But it, yeah, I think, you know, honestly, it's, it's, you, you said it a couple of times now. It really is a story that I don't think anybody has ever experienced. And, and, and to me, I think that's the best part is that if you are a music lover, there's just enough music in there for you. If you're a crime lover, there's plenty of crime in there. There's also the, the tale. I think the biggest part is it's the father daughter tale. And I think once that gets out more, I think it'll be, um, I think more people will latch on to that tale because that is, that's a very important bond that I think a lot of, you know, a lot of people have and, and, and it's important. And and that love aspect inside of that, I think is the coolest story. Although all the other like fun parts that I, I wrote in there with like the, what ifs this really is happening in the music industry. Eh, I might, I might have a knock on my door by a few agencies, but <laughs> <laughs> I think any rock band that's ever crossed a border in a tour bus has yeah. had that fear for a minute. I mean, there's all kinds of famous stories about how oh, rock stars yeah. have smuggled things over borders and gotten things through customs. Yeah. It does oh, happen. Definitely. We know it happens. Oh, and 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 believe me, it I don't think that my story is unique that no one's ever done it. I just used a whole lot of it to take it away to a whole new extreme. That was that's the only difference. You know, it's like when when someone's smuggling 1 kilo, I'm talking about smuggling 400 well, that's kilos the thing. It's the a difference music. between crime and organized crime. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is really like, I don't think anybody's been on this level yet. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm hoping that with with this tale coming out, though, that it really just does, it brings a new, a different just light to, you know, even roadies that tour. I, I hope that they read it and they see that it, it, it was a good tale yeah. that was just fun for them to read as opposed to, there's no real shots taken at anybody. There's a couple like little jokes about audio guys and lighting guys and things like that. But it's it really, I tried to stay away from ever like just being a jerk in the book. Right. So, well, if it ever gets made into a Netflix series, um, you might be able to get a little corner of the wall at the organized crime museum in Vegas. Have you ever gone there? Oh, the no, I've not been there. It's very cool. It's okay. It's all about obviously the mafia, but the cartels and, you know, the the smuggling ways that they do it, how the uh, the feds investigate all the way up through the decades of of organized crime through prohibition, all of that. But then there's a whole wall of all of the different ways organized crime has been portrayed in Hollywood. Oh, that's right. With like scripts from the Sopranos and Goodfellas and like all of that stuff. It's it's really cool. If you're ever looking for something to do in Vegas that doesn't involve booze or gambling, <laughs> you can go to the Mob Museum and there's even a okay. speakeasy in the basement, which is really cool. Ah, that's really rad. Yeah, there there is like there is just something about it's it really does captivate so many different genres and so many different ways people have tried to do organized crime from the, I mean, there was the gaudy TV show there for a long time. Just watched I mean, it. Yeah. Yeah. Like literally on like primetime TV. So, so things like that, I think I, I believe that inside of there, I did everyone as much justice as I possibly could to try to write a tale that is super unique, but using things that obviously have been done and, you know, like, Organized crime isn't new. So right. you're going to read things. You're like, oh, OK, but whoa, I never thought about it like that. So that it would be rad to see it one day, even yeah, taken to the new level of of TV and film. Well, if somebody <laughs> wants to get the book, tell them where they can go to get it. Right now, the best place to go would be Amazon and just type in the roadie cartel. And if you're a Kindle reader, it's obviously there for digital downloads. And then, um, yeah, it's on there, I think, for like 20 twenty dollars twenty dollars and 99 cents maybe and amazon prime it and kdp publishing will ship it to you <laughs> and what about the audiobook part of it the audiobook will come out later this year and that'll or i mean um early 2024 so that'll be out and that'll be on all the big hopefully i think the biggest one would be audible right because that's where most people do their stuff but i believe that the um the the recording house was telling me that it goes to a few others so i think it's like google has their own read or audiobook and then i think spotify 
has one now too. So I think it'll be on as many different platforms as we can possibly put it for people to consume. Now that it's out, the next obvious question, Mm -hmm. what's next? Book two. No rest for the wicked. No, I've already, actually, I think I'm like seven chapters into writing um, the sequel to this one. And it's, it's, it is, it's, it is a, my, it is a baby, you know, and my baby is growing and it's really fun to feed it and, and watch not only my writing um, get better, but like, it, it just is really cool to see something that's never been there be brought to life. And, and I don't know, I have to say it's, it's really cool. And, and though I know that a lot of people went through probably hell in the pandemic, it was really cool to come out on the other side and and try something different that I would have never probably done in a million years. Well, it's something that you and I have in common. And a lot of the other musicians that I have on the show, too, is everybody had that opportunity to go from normal mm-hmm. to scared, not knowing what was next, to accepting the reality that is nobody really knows what's going on. So I'm going to take a chance on something. So for me, it was my company and the podcast and all of these other things for other artists. It was side projects, building their own studios, producing other artists. And Mm -hmm. for you, it was taking the career you had (laughs) and turning it into being an author and releasing a book. It's kind of amazing. Yeah, I highly recommend I know you said something earlier about writing a book and I have talked to like three people now, um, not like in a coaching way, but they're like, how did you do it? How did you start it? And I and honestly, it's like um, I said earlier, well, it just started with this idea and then I just started putting it down. There was no real blueprint to it and and taking those chances building a company doing things that are different, I think are super important for anyone to do and I and as crazy as it is it's very fulfilling and i feel very blessed to not only have been a part of something giant like the music industry but now here i am potentially having a whole different you know impact in a different industry so you know it's it's been it's been really cool and and then to have people like frank new friends like you support me and i feel like every day i meet someone new that's just like wow that is I, okay, cool. <laughs> well, to quote Paul Simon, like, you're going to have to do something because you got a tattoo on your neck. So what else are you going to do? <laughs> I mean, what else am I going to do? But, it, but yeah, it, it, I mean, but it's so cool, though, because now they imagine. And, and I think that's the coolest thing. And I, I have so much more respect for all the artists I ever worked for. And now I get that whole music, how you can move people. It's just so cool. It's imagination. Let your imagination run wild. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm super excited for you. Book two thank is you. on the way. And we got to thank Frank. I, I Oh, my gosh. I, I the, the second that I get off of this, I'm texting Frank and telling him thank you. Because this was, thank you for taking the time and letting me join on. So, I mean, you have so many cool guests. And, and, it, and it's just been a pleasure chatting with you. And I, I hope to get up to Boston soon. So yeah, let me know. Actually... Frank and I will take you out for some good Italian food. No tacos. No, t- I, I would absolutely, I would tell you no. <laughs> well, if you check the show notes of this episode, you'll find all of Philip's links. You'll find the link to listen to Frank's episode. If you want to go back to his episode, which is number 32 and all of the links to get the roadie cartel. And we look forward to the audiobook version coming in 2024. Thank you so much for having me on. There he is, roadie turned writer, Philip J. Chris. His new book, The Roadie Cartel, just came out on Friday, December 1st and is available anywhere you get your books. I put a link up in the show notes of this episode to make it easier to order online. You'll also find all of Philip's links, the original episode with our mutual friend, Frank Scambalone, episode 32, and the custom playlist for episode 183. I make a custom playlist for every full-length episode of the Mistress Carrie podcast that features all of the artists and songs that we referenced in the interview. If you liked what you heard, don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe to the Mistress Carrie podcast. New full-length episodes come out every Wednesday, plus every weekday, you you get the sit rep. It's all your rock news, music headlines, and entertainment updates 
boil down to about five minutes. And you never know when we're going to release a bonus episode. You can join me live every Tuesday night at 8.30 Eastern on my official Facebook page for my video show, Cocktails in the War Room. And of course, you can always find me on the radio. Get the details on all of that and more at mistresscarry.com. And while you're on the website, definitely do some holiday shopping in the online Mistress Carrie store. The Mistress Carrie podcast, a proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. It's time to get your checking account to zero with free checking from PenFed. That's zero ATM fees, zero balance requirements, and zero time spent waiting for your paycheck to direct deposit because you can receive it up to two days early. Open your account with just $25 and see how big zero can be. Apply online today at penfed.org slash free checking. Early direct deposit eligibility may vary between pay periods and timing of payers funding. To receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed, insured by NCUA. Permit me here and now to promise as a good comrade and a fellow artist that I will not report any of the, this, whatever it is, to the police. What, what would you say you do here? Abandoned Albums is a podcast that employs a deep bench of musical archivists. These determined individuals dig through the record crates of the world to find the lost music of artists. Using a patent-pending algorithm and spirited debate, we pick one album as an inroad to talk about and then reach out to the artists. We invite them into Thunder Love Studio. When we're lucky, they say yes. Abandoned Albums is a little like this. That was TNUC by Grand Funk Railroad. And uh, I spelled the word backward in my head and I immediately went out <laughs> and the <laughs> They're like, do you know who we are? And we were like, I mean, kind of. Well, you're dressed in, you're in blue. Of course we know you. <laughs> yeah, you're blue. <laughs> yeah, you're blue, you're mad. Abandoned Albums isn't about the show, and it's not about the host or hosts. It's about the artist's work and making sure it remains, or in some cases, lands on the cultural radar. It's why Abandoned Albums is the only music podcast that matters. Wow, that was really, really enjoyable. Thanks, fellas. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you both. Yeah. All right. Cool. Abandoned Albums is a proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network.